Welcome to Jewish Cinematheque, where we meet some of the important faces involved with films that tackle aspects of the Jewish experience. Today we meet documentary filmmaker Shani Rosanes, who, together with Sagi Bornstein and Udi Nier, has made a powerful new film about Prime Minister Golda Meir, simply called Golda. The film's an official selection of both Doc Aviv, Tel Aviv, and Doc NYC film festivals. And this is Shani's feature documentary directorial first. Indeed it is. Shani, welcome to Jewish Cinematheque. Hi, Eric. Good to be here. So how did this film happen? How did it evolve? What's... Well, um, we started working on it. It was... Um, Late, late 2016, there was a, an American uh, presidential race, and there was quite a prominent woman there, you know. Uh, we're talking about the Hillary campaign of 2016. The whole campaign was infused with the historical meaning of having the first woman candidate and so on. And, and of course, it, w it was something worthy of mentioning and remembering, and, but it kind of made us realize, well, wait a minute, there was a, an Israeli prime minister already making it to the top of you know, ruling her own country 40 years ago. And we felt she was a bit somewhat overlooked. And we figured it's a time. It's time to talk about women in politics and women in general. You know, it was actually before the Me Too age, but it was quite clear that, you know, that there's this, a change coming. And, um, and we've actually, the responses since have, have shown us that there's great curiosity and there's a great will to know and learn more about her. And Wasn't Golda the, the second woman head of state at the time? Well, actually, she was officially the third woman to ever be a head of state. However, she is the first one to be, the, to be making it to this position without any family ties to her predecessors. Huh. Either way, it's not an easy position to hold. It's not easy to be a woman in politics, definitely not in the 50s, 60s, 70s. But you can take away her credit for what she did. So you were born in Bacham and you grew up in Israel. Right. Golda was really past tense. I mean, you... Yes. Yeah. So what was, you know, what, what did you think of Golda as a young person and as a teenager? It, it's interesting. You know, when I grew up, I think I was maybe eight or nine or ten. I remembered Golda. There was a very uh, sort of an Israeli bestseller called um, Hamichdal in Hebrew. It was, uh, it was about basically the, 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 the failings of the war. Um, Which war are we talking about? 1973 war. The war Yom Kippur war. Yeah, exactly. And it featured her face in a very sour expression. And I remember that quite prominent on our, on our bookshelf. And I remember when I was about eight or nine, and you know, it's the time that you're as a young girl, you're trying to think and look for, for other women and, and look for inspirational... Models. Models, exactly. And I remember asking my mom about her. And you know, growing up, she was also uh, on the 10 shekels bill, when we still had a bill. And I thought, what about a Golda Meir, mom? You know, she made it to prime minister. You know, she's probably a very important woman, one to admire. And she, and she told me, Shani, if you're looking for a woman to admire, Golda Meir is the wrong one. Wow. That was, that was huh. you know, because that's because the Yom Kippur War in our house, and not just in our house, I think for, for many people of the same generation, my dad's generation, people born uh, around the early 50s who served in the war, um, also, sociologists will talk to you about it. Historians will talk to you about it. The Yom Kippur War was a watershedding moment for Israel society. It was a, a national trauma. And, um, and of course, it inflicted also on how Golda is remembered and seen. Um, but let, let's stop for a moment and sort of set it up, because 67 was this glorious victory. Six days, Israel takes all this territory, beats all of these enemies. And over the intervening years, when Golda is prime minister from 69 on, there's this sense of, what, invincibility? I would say so. So then where does she fit into that? You, you know, you say it's a watershed moment. It's, it's, is it because of you went from one extreme to the other? All of a sudden, the country was close to annihilation? Indeed, it was. I mean, the, one of, I mean Golda for herself, she's, she's interesting, but we, we found special interest in her for the you know for being the person there at that moment in time these years it's hard to say these years are super crucial in israeli history because it feels like every moment in israeli history is crucial but definitely if you look at what happened i mean the the, the importance of 1967 
in the in the sense of national atheists, in the sense of the of the impact it had on the almost I'd say on the psyche of the you know of the people living in Israel, sort of finally feeling because you could see that if you're reading, if you're listening, if you're researching the first 20 years of the founders and the politicians, there was real fear that this Zionist project, that this a, you know, unbelievable, basically almost impossible mission that they, they've succeeded in, that it's on the brink. It's, it, it was never, there was constant fear this might be over any minute. And then 67 brought, a, you know, the confidence, the, 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 the euphoria almost. But then at the same time, it unleashed a lot of, all of a sudden, this, the, this confidence also unleashed a lot of things that were kind of buried and were not discussed before. And if you're talking about internal politics and things, you know, that tearing up the Israel society till this day, issues like, which we also deal with in the movie, we talk about the ethnic, the, you know. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a great moment where you have one of your interviewees was a member of the uh, Israeli Black Panthers. Exactly. And, and partially <clears throat> one, one of the reasons that it, it starts at this moment in time is that there's a reason, okay, we're sticking around, it's happening. Now we can start looking into inside and thinking, what are we doing? So, and, and, and making it, the country a better country. Indeed. So, on the one hand, there's this uh, post-1967 that's somewhat of euphoria. It, it actually, it's a country that's that it's almost in a, a schizophrenia. Because, because on the one hand, there's this euphoria, but then there's a lot of international pressure to find a solution to the territories that were gained or occupied, you know, during the 67 war. And there, there's there's economic blossom and there's also always somewhat of a, the, the, the growth in, in, in gap, in, you know, inequality gap right. is, is being felt. Um, you're talking about um, the Palestinian, national Palestinian movement becoming a real issue in ways that it hasn't been before, kind of changing the map of threats. Because before that, it was very much focused on Egypt, which was definitely the strongest Arab superpower with alliance with Syria, same alliance that they keep during 1973, and then having the Palestinian problem all of a sudden as this major threat um, coming from the Jordanian side, it actually worked in favor of Jordan-Israeli right. connections. But and it, things are changing. Things are Put changing. A chart, and Golda's going, smack in and the middle. And she's smack in the middle. She's smack in the middle. Many of the decisions she and her cabinet made, many of the the uh, solutions that were that were uh, curved back then, they are still forming or influencing current Israeli politics and current Israeli. Interesting. So, what you did was quite incredible. You found this interview mm -hmm. that had been done with her, an off the record interview. You're right. That was done what just a year before she died, or the Not year. Even. No, it was made in May '78, and she passed away in December of the same year. So how did that? How did you find that? I mean, it was an off-the-record piece. She seemed to be keep saying, you know, well, is this off the record? It's not going to be shown, and yet well, she was allowing it to be. Filmed. Indeed, indeed. So, <clears throat> so we found this one. A, a researcher who who is a great, uh, he is very good at what he does, and he knows the Israeli archive through and through. And he ended up finding this very old um, tape in a umatic format. That is, it's basically a big black box. Nobody even knows how to open it. Nobody knew what's in it. We only knew there's Golda. It says Golda. We knew it was connected to that particular show. What happened is that we found knew, it where? In the archive. In the, in the Israeli? The Israeli archive has been, you know, for many years it was run down. It wasn't really, there, was, was, there were not enough funds to digitize and catalog everything properly. So they knew they had this tape, but they didn't really know what was in it. And we had to take a gamble. We need to digitize this and see what's in it. So the, for the viewers, just to digitize it simply because you weren't able to watch it exactly. in the previous We form. had to convert to a format <clears throat> that is watchable. Um, and Uri and Sagi said, let's do it. Uh, let's take this gamble. And we struck gold. Um, and let's talk about this off-the-record interview. So what happens is that she's giving an interview to a leading Israeli talk show. And the cameras keep rolling after the interview is concluded. And she just uses the opportunity for what I would say a legacy interview. She's, so she's very much aware of the fact she's still being filmed, sometimes almost bemoaning the fact that she, you know, because they ask her, tell us more about your political initiatives for peace. And she says, well, well, now it's off air. What's the point? You know, sort of like, um, but she, I think she appreciated the fact, you know, she's the, the elder of the tribe, and she appreciated the fact to have her say. And she's happy to talk not just about politics and the same issues that keep surfacing, you know, 
and and make it to the fi to the to the on air standard interview. She's happy for a change to talk about ideals and some of her personal experience and America and and cultural influences into Israel and 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 social socialism and the future of the social movement and her. So for us, this was. And you know, when we saw that, there's something just so captivating in her, how, in how candid she is and authentic and grounded, sitting there smoking, of course, as, as she was, like, once lighting one cigarette after another. Yeah, I, at her one Chester point, Field. I, I think the interviewer actually goes over to light another cigarette because she, yes, it's yes. crazy. And just, she sits there and she's very comfortable and she's very much sort of making her plea so for happy to the way we see it at least, you know, happy to, to have this opportunity. And, um, and when we saw that, we felt like th this is something that we can't just let go of. You, you do such a wonderful job. This becomes almost like the spine of the exactly. movie, where you are using clips throughout the film mm -hmm. to tell her story. And just, you know, for the, for the audience, you know, just very briefly. So this was a woman born where? and. And, and what happened? She was in the States. Can you just... Yeah, she's born in Ukraine in 1998. And um, she says, you know, she later says that um, one of her first memories in life is getting ready for the pogrom, you know, having the doors uh, barricaded and, you know, escaping and going up. And um, so that, that's something that, that, that she takes with her for the rest of her life, that fear, that, that anxiety. And you think that really affected her judgment? Definitely. That's, I mean, if you ask Golda what she is, the first thing she'll say is that she's a Jew. Second, she would probably be a socialist. But, but being a Jew and understanding that Jews are under threat, that's something she remembers and feels from a very, very young age, and that's something she takes with her uh, throughout her career and, and why she decides to devote herself for, for public work in the sake of the Zionist movement. So she, at eight, at the age of eight, she moves to Milwaukee, following her dad who moved three years earlier. He's bringing the whole family from Kiev um, there. This is where she spends her formative years. She finishes school. She wants to keep on going to for high, for high school, and her parents don't understand why she needs to go to school. Uh, they want her to get married and, and start a family, and maybe classic for the time. Yeah, the, 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 her parents kept a little, a little, um, a little. Uh, I'd say you know, uh, basic, basic home products store, which she often had to work in, helping her mom, um, reluctantly because she loved school. She really much, very much enjoyed and she it. She excelled. She was, she did, and then she escapes. She goes following her sister. She leaves home uh, to Denver. I think that's I believe that's where her sister lived, yeah. and then over there, her sister was involved in Zionist circles. And one time, Ben Gurion comes to for a lecture or some sort of meeting, and she gets to hear him, and that kind of that changed the course of her life. And she just falls for the Zionism bug, and soon after, she decides she wants to move to Israel. In 1920, why she does this? She does that with her husband. With her husband, with Maurice. Um, who followed her um, because he was so captivated her, by her, I assume. Because he, he was never, he was never a big Zionist. He he would have never done that by himself. Mm -hmm. uh, but he did it for her. And then she joins the kibbutz. It took her some time to to become a kibbutz member. There's a story about how they they turn her down several times in Merchavia, and then once she had her um, record player brought, sent to her. And they learned about her having a record player. They agreed that she'll be she'll join, assuming she will give the record player for the use of the whole kibbutz for everybody to enjoy. And finally, that's how that bought her the ticket in. But that was short lived. Um, Maurice does not enjoy the kibbutz. They don't stay there for too long. They move to Jerusalem, where they end up living in quite dire poverty. But she manages to find a, a job in one of the Zionist you know, it's like an infrastructure. It's like the Solel Bonnet. And from there, soon after, one of her bosses there, uh, Remez, he, according to him, was also a lover. Uh, he, he sees her potential, knowing English. Knowing At this point, she's separated. She's separated in 1928 already, mm -hmm. yeah. um, if I'm not mistaken. No, no this is where she starts her, her public career as well. Uh, but they never, they never, you know, her, she had a very special connection with, with Maurice Dillihand of her her life to the end of his life. 
Um, and she was very much devoted to her family and to her kids. And you can see, for me as a woman, it was fascinating to, to see and read her, you know, some of the things she's writing in, in, in 1928 and 9 and 30 and realizing I'm experiencing exactly the same thing, those dilemmas, this, this, this pro, you know, of how to, to balance between my, my career and my, my professional goals and my family and my, my children. I was... Golda was my third baby in the last three years. I've, I also had two babies during the, t the course of making a, this film. So Two babies that were human. Real babies, <laughs> uh, flesh and blood. So, uh, Which also brought me closer to her and clo brought me closer to the cause of telling a story of a woman in power, you know, woman in power, women in politics, um, realizing some of these challenges are still there and we need to, you know, we need to sort of look into that and try to see how do we, when we change the discourse about women and about politics, maybe we manage to, to, to finally bring some of these challenges to better solutions. And then, of course, she rises in the government. But one of the things that I found most interesting, and, and you raise this in the film, is her perception in the, how she was received in the United States, even today, mm -hmm. how she's perceived. Yep. You ask most American Jews, most Americans, mm -hmm. Golda, oh, she was a hero, she was a this, she raised money for the state in 48, it was because of her, millions of dollars. And you ask Israelis, and what you're saying now, and you bring this out in the film, is that it's not so simple. Right. Well, There's a divided Israel. Has that changed at all with time? Is there more of a sense of, look what this woman had done? Yeah, maybe she made some mistakes along the way. Well, I think the movie has, has started this conversation, and we saw that with some of the publications, some of the, the critics, and we've also even had, we mentioned we had a, a black Israeli panther on the movie film, and even him, he uh, writes, he wrote a few weeks after he's seen the movie about how it made him see her in a whole different light, and he understands her, and, and I, I would say pretty much forgive her you know, knowing and understanding much more of who she is and what she was dealing with back then. So in, in that aspect, we were, we were very touched by that uh, response. And we were, we were very much touched by many people's response who were willing, even people, you know, I can tell you personally, for me, one of the most stressful moments was showing the film to my dad. My dad has a, and he, he has his gang, the, the people from the reserve uh, uh, service that, 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 you know, he knows them. They go back together for, for, for 40 years. They've been in the service together. They've been in the service together and they meet regularly. And it was very important for me. And they're all Yom Kippur War veterans. And it was very important for me to, to see their response to that. Was that a goal to try and rehabilitate Golda? I wouldn't say rehabilitate, but we were very much from the get-go interested in just showing a bigger picture. You know, sort of bringing... And, and in a movie, we, 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 we try to give it to the viewer to decide. We just... We show... We talk to some of her... Strongest opponent. We showed. We talked to some of our, you know, biggest admirers. And wow, fans. you had Uri Avneri there saying that she never should have been prime minister. Indeed, she wasn't. Have, she wasn't. That was qualified. Yossi Balin. That was, oh, was Yossi, Yossi Balin. Okay. But we also have Uri Avneri who says right at, at the bat, we had a great hate story. You know, they were enemies from the get go. Um, but then on the other hand, you have people like Tzvi, Tzvi Zemir, Tzvi Kazemir, who was the head of the Mossad, who is one of her biggest fans. During her time. During her time, they worked very closely together, and he's a great fan. And, and so, and for us, it was quite clear from the beginning, we will let you, the viewer, watch them both, and we will let you decide. So, and I can tell you also, following, if we go back to my dad and his, his, his uh, service uh, uh, friends, I don't think I've convinced them. I don't think people who have, you know, survived the war and were traumatized by the war will, will, are willing to forgive any of the leadership back at that time. But I think they now understand it better and they're willing to hear that. Um, and I think that for itself was quite, quite an achievement because it brings us to a, a different discourse. That is, but you know, when we, we talk about our leaders and we sometimes expect them to be superheroes. And um, not that I want to take off any responsibility off their shoulders. These are people making life and death decisions that, that and you, if you're not the right person for the job, you shouldn't be there. But then at the same time, no one is perfect. And we, we maybe want to see the complexity, the depth uh, of, of and, and how every person brings his conviction, his history, his biography, his, you know, it, it just, just try to make it a bit, a bit more of a whole uh, 
Let's take a look at a clip from the film Golda. גולדה אישרה לי דברים שאני לא אחזור אליהם פעמים, תקרצי לי בעיניים ותחייכי לי. לא מפני שזה נעים לי, אין ברירה. כל התסמיכים היהודיים היו בה. זה שקר, אם אומרים שלא אכפת אם נהיה רוב או נהיה מיעוט. אנחנו כולנו פלסטינאים. למה? יש לי הפספורט הישן. איזה דבר מטומטם זה. לצערי, היו שסילפו את דמותה. של העם היהודי, וגם היום. היא לא הבינה את הכאב, את הכעס. כמו שהיא עלתה ביום אחד, כך היא התקמצה לך. אין נורא. אף אחד לא חי. אי אפשר לדעת כאילו מחשבות כל כך בין אחד. היא הבינה שזה נגמר. Golda became prime minister in 1969 uh, because Levi Eshkol passes away. Uh, it seems that at that point, what, you show that there's a little bit of a, a, a dueling between Moshe Dayan and Yigal Alon and, and Golda to be see who's, the next, who's going to take over. Mm -hmm. Over the course of those five years, you, you show us Golda during the War of Attrition. Uh, there's a moment there which most Americans don't know about, this whole question of the letter of the high school seniors. Uh, one of the individuals is one of those letter writers. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was that all about? You, she, she just was just obstinate. Here are these young high school seniors saying, make peace. Nachum Goldman is ready to be your envoy. He's gotten the okay. Mm -hmm. And you say no. So right. it, was that just what she was all about? And, and then again, later on, when you talk about her in the Yom Kippur War, and remember that she is Moshe Dayan, the hero of the Six-Day War. Right. As defense minister, by her side. Well, she was perceived in Israel, and, for, and still is, I think, for many people, seen as a refusenik, you know, as a, as a stubborn uh, naysayer. Uh, what happens with Goldman is that we know now that that offer uh, that, that he claims that he got to go to Egypt was probably not a real offer and probably wouldn't have had much of any result. But it didn't matter, because once it was out... Um, and it created the, the impression that the government had, had Nasser's hand reaching out. So they had a chance to make peace with, uh, with exactly. Nasser in Egypt. With Egypt, and they, and, they, and, Golda. and they refused. And that went, I mean, when that was, was out, and the, the impression was made that the, the Israeli government is so in love with the new position of the powerful, you know, country following the 67 glorious victory, and those, the bunch of senior, uh, seniors in high, high school seniors that were coming from the best families, the guy who started the letter, um, he is the, f we don't mention it, we don't have a chance, but he's the son of a minister in Golda's government, in Golda's cabinet. Crazy. She was very much concerned about that because she was so, you know, she was all I idealistic and driven by, you know, what's to be future and, 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 you know, in our youth, I mean, take care of them. And seeing that really troubled her. And that was on the front page of Israeli newspapers. Yes, yes. Crazy. Yeah. And then one of the things you do when you move in and you focus in on uh, the war of attrition in 70, 71, and then finally the Yom Kippur War, you focus in on those lost Israeli souls, the many right. soldiers. And, and was this just growing up with your father? And I imagine he lost many comrades in battle. 
Yeah. Well, not just me, also Sagi and his, I mean, it's, uh, and the war of attrition sort of being seen as Israel's forgotten war, even though it, 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 it did take the life of too many soldiers. Uh, well, you need to understand the, co the connection between the war of attrition and the Yom Kippur War in the sense that the last move in the war, there's, there's a ceasefire agreement reached, and then the Egyptians break it. They move their um, missiles beyond the agreed lines. But the U.S. and Russia let it go. We, we need to also keep that in mind. It's something, you know, there's so much to say, but we, with, the, with the movie, you're so limited in time. Israel and Egypt... This is a proxy, they are proxy agents for Russia and, and, and the U.S. And we're talking about the high days of the Cold War. I mean, this is... But that's is, then, it does, has nothing to do with today. No, I'm being sarcastic. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. A, lot of, a lot of that, you know, Israel, and of course Israel being allied with, with the U.S., and the, especially the great connection between Golda and Nixon and Golda and Kissinger. Uh, which was a great asset. We, we also don't remember that. We, we, I wish we had more time to talk about everything in the movie and now, but we need to keep in mind, Golda's connections with the American is the one, for example, when she meets with Adam Prime Minister with Nixon, she gets the agreement regarding the nuclear weapons today. that is accordingly, apparently, supposedly, if there were any nuclear weapons for me. Israel, that is the consensus that she, you know, it's a deal Nixon's that she makes gonna, with Nixon. Nixon's look the other way. Exactly. Agreeing to look the other way in return for Israeli uh, uh, promise never to run any, any experiments, nuclear experiments. And this is pretty much the deal that is, exist, that is in existence, assuming there is a deal in existence, till this day. You know, American Jews forget that the United States was not Israel's best friend, mm -hmm. really, until Golda made that happen. Exactly. I mean, the, the, uh, that's very much true. I mean, it's not that... Let's put it that she, she takes it five steps ahead. She, she cements that alliance and that relationship um, in a clear way. Of course, let's not be naive. It also corresponds with America's interest in the region in general and in their interest in the bigger picture in the, in the, in the Cold War. But she understands that. And there's something about her personality that is just taking them in. You're talking about the difference between the way Golda is perceived in the U.S. and the way she's perceived in Israel. In, Israel, in the U.S., she was seen, and also when she went, goes for, for meetings with Nixon, she's one of ours. Right. Her accent, her, you know, oh, her, the her knowledge, the culture, indeed. And, oh. and, and that worked. She used it. She knew, you know, she used it in her benefit. She was, she was, she was a charmer. People who knew her loved her. They were all, she was very warm. She was very affectionate. She was very funny. These, are, I have to say, was quite a surprising fact for me. You know, growing up with this sour photo of, of Golda as this old grumpy lady, and then discovering her vitality and her charisma and her, also her femininity. She was, she had many suitors throughout her life, all the time. There was something very magnifying in her character. People were just drawn to her, especially in the U.S. I thank you so much for well, making you, this Eric. film, this well. important documentary, and for joining us on Jewish Cinematheque. Thank you, and, and we'll be touring all over. You'll find us in the next couple of months. Keep your eyes open. Golda. All right. Thank you. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. And we're especially pleased to remind you that thanks to a generous matching gift from the Cayley family, every new or increased dollar you donate to JBS will be worth double to JBS. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.